people as human beings have a natural drive to bond and learn, but we crush it out of them. Matt, you just, okay, wait a second. You just like unlocked the next level for me. Hi, I'm Matt Eagle, the host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for leaders looking to improve the ROI of their investments in customer experience and culture together. I'm excited to be here today with Tara Brady, who's the leader for customer experience for Provident Bank. Thanks for joining, Tara. Thank you for having me, Matt. I'm excited to be here. Um, I guess just to kick us off, you've always been a fan of uh, how customer experience and culture and employee experience all go together. So I'm delighted to have you on the show. Do you want to share a little bit more with the audience about why uh, you put so much emphasis on how employee experience and customer experience go together? Absolutely. So I have worked in banking for 20 years, and my introduction uh, to the banking environment was solely around customer experience. How do we connect with people? How do we make human emotional connections? And how do we use that to progress um, sales, solutioning, products, etc.? I was immediately enamored by how much I could learn about a customer just by being curious about them and asking questions and getting to know them. And I turned that passion into becoming a CX director because I enjoy the ability to teach others how to do that. Um, What I've learned as I've transitioned from the doer, right, to the influencer of CX is that there's absolutely nothing that I can do without team members, or as we would say, employees. Um, And I have to inspire and influence an entire organization with which none of the people that have to do the work report to me directly. Right. So I have to get them as excited about customer experiences and what they're doing um, without any of that direct that direct lineage to, you know, the work that I'm doing. So I have to get folks so excited to wait on customers, learn about customers, be curious about customers. Um, And I think that's the tie. Right. When people say how do employee experience and customer experience go together? The question is, how do they not? And nothing that we do as CX leaders can be done without all of these folks. So um there's such an important piece of tying together, you know, I call it the three E's, right? The education, uh, the empowerment of our employees, right? Do we give them the tools, the how, the what they need to know? Do we empower them to go out and use those pieces? And then do we give them the efficiencies in order to activate on that? And without those three pieces moving together, right? I can say, go deliver a great customer experience. Um, but if I don't give the education on how we want it done, empower you to do it and then create efficiencies, it doesn't happen. So in my mind, you cannot do one without the other. They have to, they have to walk hand in hand um, in order for organizations to be successful. Yeah. I mean, so much of the great customer experience is a human to human interaction. As human beings, we have emotions, we have experiences with others, which make the experience better. Uh, it's not just about getting information or a transaction. It's about the interaction itself often is part of what makes it gratifying for us. And I think employees, um, you know, when they when they approach it in a in a way that's meaningful for them, it's like they're giving a gift. You know, they're giving it they're they're giving to other people and they can be proud of the experience. And 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 often we focus on the efficiency and the cost and not about how to make the employee proud and make that human connection stronger. I agree with you 100%. I also think that there's a ton of assumption in customer experience. We assume if we hire someone into a customer experience role, they understand how to deliver a customer experience, right? And that for a lot of people is true. They want to deliver a great experience and they want to be a part of that. But if we don't give them the tools and the training, right? So a lot of people say, go out and do X, Y, Z behavior. We don't explain exactly how. We don't explain why, right? I think that's the biggest misstep for folks is behave like this. I want you to behave like this because our customers have shared that they have very positive reactions. I want you to behave like this because our customers have given us feedback that they feel more connected to us, right? When we provide the what we want you to do with the why we want you to do it, and then the how, I feel that employees are so much more engaged and activating in that, as well as being excited about it. And then the tie back is bringing your employees into the processes. Our customers are saying, this feels good when you do this. You're saying you have to go into five different systems and within the organization to do it. And it's hard to do it that way, or it's difficult, right? So that's where those efficiencies come in for me. That's where we get out of the way um, and help create those positive impacts for the customers. But 
getting our employees engaged with the what, why, and how, I think is such an important step and a step that is often skipped. And I think you can see it when you go out to different retailers or different customer service interactions and interact with people that some people are just going through the motions. They were told what to do, but not why or how it's important, right? So they'll do the steps, but you're not getting the delivery that you expected. So similarly to what I said, you know, a couple minutes ago, I can design the best CX program in the world. If my team members don't know what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, and the impact it's going to have, it doesn't matter. And it's not the type of thing where I can give a directive and say, go do this, and it's going to be great, right? You have to put that human emotion, you have to put that energy into it, and you have to bring um, that excitement for the process. Otherwise, the customers walk away going, yeah, they did that because they had to. And early in what you were saying, Tara, you talked about behaviors used, uh, I think, as a very magic word in thinking about culture, behavior. Because uh, a lot of times with culture and and change, people focus on mindsets and skills um, and not behavior enough. Um, can can you talk a, bit, a little bit more about what you mean by behaviors, like adopting behavior to be more customer centric? What type of behaviors are you thinking about? So specifically, the most important behavior that that I would consider, at least in my mind, a behavior is, is empathy, right? And active listening. Um, I do a lot of conversations around active listening because I feel that people listen to get to the to the end, especially in service environments, right? I have a problem with my debit card. It's not doing this. Okay, debit card, let me go look it up. We're not listening to that whole process. So being empathetic to a customer's frustration is the most important thing to me. If a customer has made contact with you, if they've initiated the contact, they're expecting a helpful response. And I can't tell you how often I walk away from interactions and I go, hmm, that wasn't helpful at all. I could have figured that out by myself. Um, I don't ever want my customers to feel that way. And then secondly, I want to make sure that we've listened all the way through. So often in the banking world, at least, customers are never going to walk in with a sign that says, I don't know how to manage my money and I screwed up, right? They're going to come in and say, your online banking didn't work or your debit card didn't work or your ATM, right? They're not going to say, I had a failure to connect or understand something. So actively listening and hearing, not only did you say, Matt, you had an issue with your debit card, but it sounds like there might be some frustration. Let me get to the root of that so you don't experience this issue again. Now I've created empathy. I understand your frustration. I'm creating a helpful environment where I'm going to solve for today's issue and future issues. And now I've built a human emotional connection that you trust me. Working with me was helpful. And it's a service or an activity that you'd like to repeat, which creates brand loyalty, connection to me, right? Next time you have an issue, you're going to go, wow, Tara was really helpful. Let me go back to her, right? So those are the types of behaviors that I'm looking to create within the organization, right? Not just solve the immediate issue, be empathetic, actively listen, look for futuristic resolution and create that human emotional connection that you want to repeat these behaviors with me again. When you kind of identify these behaviors that you want, do you have a certain kind of core set of behaviors that you're trying to, when you, when you work with your team, that you're trying to get them to appreciate and practice those behaviors consistently over time? Yeah. So a thousand percent. So the, the, the things that I focus solely on is number one, defining the definition between customer service and customer experience. In my opinion, a service is something that I go so I go to get my oil changed. I expect, right, you're going to change my oil and I'm going to get in my car and hopefully under 30 minutes and be on my way, right? That's the basic expectation. When you think about an experience, that's something that I find enjoyable. I want to repeat. I want to go out um, and talk to people about what an amazing, I'm never going out and saying I went to Jiffy Lube. Oh my gosh, best oil change of my life, right? That's just a service that everyone's processing. When I think about creating experiences and, and those behaviors and tying that together, I want people to feel heard, right? So we go back to active listening. I want us to be doing a really great job of asking questions. If you come into a branch or you connect with someone in a contact center, I want us to have ask questions again to understand today's needs and what you might need futuristically and be prepared that we're going to set up that kind of human relationship so that you know we might be interacting again, right? So tying it back to how are we asking questions? How are we actively listening to all of the responses? And how are we building out those connections? Those connections are as simple as logging the conversation in a system so that if maybe the next time you come into a branch or connect, maybe you don't speak to me, but whoever 
else does speak with you can pick up where we left off, right? So you don't feel as a customer that you're starting over. You don't have to retell your story. We're engaged as an organization. So now that tie to the brand, the whole brand is listening to me, not just Tara. Um, While I liked her and she was helpful, I can also continue my business, right? My business doesn't have to stop because she might not be here. So those are the things that I'm trying to put a heightened focus on, how we talk about customer experience, right? How it it is, I don't ever say customer service. I avoid saying it at all cost. Um, I am always driving people to think about it as an experience. I'm always asking our employees, talk to me about your last customer experience interaction. How was it? Do you want to do it again? Um, understanding the viewpoint of our employees from what they feel is a great customer experience, right? So if the best customer experience you've ever had was at a coffee shop, and that's the level that you're setting at, right? We might have to talk about, you know, level setting, what that looks like and how we can move up. So um, those are the things that are top of mind for me as we're, you know, creating and building out our CX program. Um, and it's interesting because the more questions I ask our team members and our employees about their experiences, the more engaged they get in the process of thinking differently. Or I'll have folks come back and say, hey, I had an experience over the weekend and it was not what I expected or it was so good that I wanted to come and tell you about it. So just by talking about it and presenting kind of these examples and getting curious with folks, they're starting to think about what experiences they have differently, which is making them think about the experiences they're delivering differently. Yeah, what you're hitting on now is the making the employees conscious of the experience they're delivering so they can be reflective and drive improvement over time themselves, but also spot opportunities that they can take advantage of and be empowered to change, as well as share those insights with others in the organization. So creating a shared vocabulary and creating space for people to learn and and have conversations about the experience actually leads to improvement because people will then feel they're heard, they'll feel that you're listening and they'll want to share and and and, and engage and get better. Absolutely. And it's it's truly like a a very inspiring experience. I spent a ton of time when I first got to the organization. Um I started with them in May of 2022. And I did a ton of journey mapping from the user experience. Tell me what our customers go through to do X, Y, Z process and tell me what you go through. And it's such a unique experience because I'm a complete stranger to the organization at this point. And I'm asking you to tell me what are the pain points for our customers and what are the pain points for you as an employee and trust that I'm going to try to make it better with you and your feedback as the person doing it. Um, And it was so inspiring because every single person I engaged with was like, tell me how we make this better. How do we help? How do we get to be a part of it? So that's that like very cool spark of, okay, CX is something I can be a part of, but it also touches me as an employee. And if we can take three steps out of a process or eliminate three types of phone calls a week for these customers that you then get to go back and say, I helped do that, right? We're also building that employee loyalty of like, I'm a part of the processes here. I'm like, I'm getting goosebumpy. I get so, I'm so dorky about this, but um, they get so engaged in the process because they got to be a part of the build and they got to be a part of the solution. And it's, it's just very inspiring and neat to be a part of. People as human beings have a natural drive to bond and learn, but we crush it out of them. Matt, you just, okay, wait a second. You just like unlocked the next level for me. So I do a whole training about the natural curiosity and the art of asking questions. And if you think about it, the average child between three and five asks like a hundred questions a day. And the average adult asks like four. Like we literally have been taught, like, don't embarrass yourself. Don't ask a stupid question. Someone in the room might be smarter, might know it. You don't want to appear to be out of the loop or not have line of sight. And we slowly, as we get older, ask less and less questions. And part of the human connection is that you cannot get to know someone and you cannot service them or help them or create an experience if you're not willing to dive deep and get in the weeds with them and get to know them. And it's such an interesting concept that we've we push that out of people. Like we literally, and then we put them in front of customers, like ask them all the questions, learn all about them, help them do all the things. And then you have two adults sitting in a room, like looking at each other and not going through those motions. I mean, it's literally one of the most basic skill sets that we're taught as children. So much of what we do in education and the business world is about testing and about teaching people to be right. But you don't learn and you don't improve without curiosity and asking questions. So how, it's hard to be right if you never learn or listen or ask questions. So 
very often, you know, more effective meetings are ones where you're asking more questions and leaving space for new ideas to emerge. And it's, it's the way we approach customer experience needs to take advantage of the insights of the people in the organization. And the way we do listening needs to, you know, leave room for more, not just employee listening, but like, um, uh, the way we approach customer listening it needs to allow more flexibility for for questioning without rigid you know preconceived ideas thousand percent and the the partner that I've been working with around RCX foundation as far as getting that VOC feedback directly from our customers does use AI to ask more questions because my biggest pain point as a CX leader is how is you know everyone drives to NPS which we can debate back and forth you know the validity of that at this point in the world but customer says I give you a 10 it was great what was great about it? Matt was nice. Our tool, what did Matt do specifically that felt nice, right? So then I can start to drive to behaviors because then I can go back to our training team and say, we have a thousand surveys that talk about um, customers enjoyed the proactive kind of questions around what we can do for their future. So we need to make sure that becomes a part of our training, that we're teaching and educating our employees on how to ask these questions. We're getting really great feedback about it. I can't go back to training and say, Matt is nice. Train that, <laughs> right? So driving to that has been has been wildly helpful as well. Yeah, and what you're h- hitting on, Tara, is the um, connection between CX, EX, and brand. And in fact, that... Um, if you define what it is your brand promise you want it to be, there are going to be elements of your customer experience that deliver on that brand promise. And then getting very intentional about what experiences you want to deliver in your CX that reinforce your brand promise. And then how can your employees help deliver on that customer experience? Then you can start listening for, for cues in the experience about whether or not you're actually delivering an experience that's congruent with your brand promise. And you, and you can have the AI, but start to synthesize for things that are congruent with your, your, the CX you want to deliver. Is it actually congruent? And you can actually ladder back up to your brand. And AI allows, because of the ability to probe and synthesize and ask follow-up and mine it much more powerful approach than you could ever take with a structured survey. Absolutely. Um, And I am a huge fan of the capabilities of AI, where I struggle with AI in the banking format, is that we are trying to design all the AI tools to help the customers outwardly facing. So the chat bots, the quick responses, where I would love to see AI turn in for institutions of my size and, and forward is that the AI sets up the human to have the best human interaction possible. So if you call in and you're visibly frustrated because you're traveling and your card won't work, right? When it gets to me as a contact center agent, I should already be in the card flow system and I should have some sort of awareness that you're very frustrated, you're out of sorts, you're out of town. And I can start my conversation by saying, hi, Matt, my name is Tara. I understand that you're traveling and there's a disconnect with your card and I'm here to help and support you. And we're going to get this fixed for you, right? You've set up the human to be the most successful and to immediately create a human connection with the customer. For me, a lot of what we're designing is going outward to the customer, but the technology behind it for the employees is not at the same speed. So when you call in, you have to sometimes repeat what you've already told the technology, or you have to start over, or you have to be re-verified, which completely defeats the the technology for the like the actual person, um, which then creates you know that disconnect. Now the human on the phone is annoyed with you. Right, because you're not up to speed with what they've already told the technology. A few things there, just want to play back for the audience and also make sure I'm listening well, Tara. Is that um, uh, you hit on um, take the approach this not just from cost and efficiency for the organization, but invest in digital and AI to make the experience better for the customer and the employee customer interaction better, not just automation and self service. Right. So don't just approach it as a way to reduce interactions and reduce costs, but to, to actually emphasize the employee customer intersection. Yeah. Um, and then give tools, uh, use the AI to help enhance the coaching and the listening and the training as opposed to just taking the human out of it. 
A thousand percent. I, I believe AI has a, a huge benefit to where we're going. Um, but so here's an interesting tidbit. We did a student um, intern project this year, right? We had 26 college students come in and I had them travel the journeys of both our customers and our employees. What does it feel like to be a customer of our institution? And what does it feel like to be onboarded as an employee? I then took that data and sent it out to a research partner and had them do it on a larger scale. Now, if I have said to you, I'm talking about a demographic of 21 year olds, what would your assumption be on how they want to communicate with their bank? Probably going to be via text or something very simple. Yeah. That's what I thought as well. When they have a problem, they want a human. Their direct feedback was, I don't want to talk to a bot that doesn't know the answer. I want the answer right now. And I want it to be via a person. Not at all the answer I was expecting, not the answer anyone was expecting. Um, and when we dug down into it, the, the, the technology is only getting them so far. They want that human, because banking is very new to them, they want someone to say, you're okay, your account's okay. They want that confirmation from a more adult to your adult was kind of how it was explained to me. Like, we want to know that someone that knows banking, not just the tech saying everything's great. They they need that that human confirmation from us. Not at all what the world is telling you about this demographic of humans. I happen to own one of them. I have a 22-year-old. He said the same thing. Mom, there's fraud. I want to talk to someone. I want someone to tell me this is okay. So again, we think we're driving towards this solution of quick self-serve, go get your answer. But when things go wrong with one of the most important things in your life, which is your financial stability, having another human say, your account's okay, it's secure, let's cancel that card and give that, AI is never going to give that, that sense of, you know, human connection that we got you, your bank has you covered, right? And those are those moments that matter, as a lot of people would say, where AI can set us up that there's someone on the phone with a fraud issue, they're stressed. You can tell me all those really important things so that when I get on the phone, I have the right human emotional connection, right? There's nothing worse than you've typed all this in and someone's like, hi, can I help you? What's going on today? And you're like, are you kidding me? I just did that. We saw a ton of that during the pandemic for banking where people went to chatbots of banks and said, I lost my job. I can't pay my bills. And the chatbot said, I'm sorry, I'm not programmed for this, right? What a terrible fail in that human emotional connection moment. So um, the cool thing is there's so much learning. There's so much opportunity for us to marry these together and create such amazing interactions for customers and really tuned in. Um, and I'm excited to see where that goes. Uh, but I'm probably always the person in the room that's like, let's not get excited yet. Cause I really want to see us set humans up to be the solution, um, and, and use that, that AI to do the mining and pull the information and, and get that there. So again, we're setting up our people, our team members, our employees to create the best experiences possible. So as a, as a CX leader, Tara, what's your role in helping reinforce and evolve the culture at the company? You know, you've talked about the individual and the training and the empowerment. If you brought in the aperture a little bit to the, the broader organization, clearly you're intersecting the culture because of, we're talking about behavior of frontline employees. What's your role within the broader culture of the bank? So the really uh, exciting part within my role is that I, I work with the executive team constantly, right? So all things that are coming through we are putting a CX lens on. So the really neat thing is I've been here, I guess it's 18 months now, right? Conversations that are happening today, as soon as a new product, a new concept that's happening is coming out of this question, ha has CX taken a look at this, right? We have pretty much in the last 10, 18 months been able to change the view of where is the customer in this project? Where is the customer in the design? Where is the customer... Um, you know, if we make this change, right, a lot of changes within financial institutions happen where there's a report out of a problem and we solve the problem and we don't travel the journey of the customer. Did we create more steps? Did we create more pain points? So we have a completely different lens now than we did 18 months ago that we're thinking about the customer throughout every step of the journey. How do we sound? How does it feel? Is it consistent? Um, and where will the customer be in this? And that's the neatest part is that I'm getting pulled into so many different projects that it's almost like, oh my gosh, how are we going to do all of these projects? But we're thinking about every step of every process with our customers at the center of all we do, which is a very exciting. So you're, it sounds like you're, um, through your influencer role and your involvement with the leadership team, 
um, you're getting pulled in that allows you to influence the mindsets and behaviors of others in the rest of the organization. That uh, over time through your interaction on these projects you get pulled into, you you don't just get to share insights and advice, but you're actually influencing their future mindsets and behaviors, which shapes the culture. Yes, which is awesome. Our CEO, CEO, this was whole concept came for like he was went out and looked for a CX leader, which is how I got connected. He is super passionate about it. We're talking about it all the time. If any like anything happened, he's like, hey, this I saw this one out to customers. How do you know what are we doing with this? Like we meet monthly. We are constantly talking about what different processes, what different improvements we're making. Um, I love the troubleshooting of things, right? So there's certain things banks have to do. There's certain notifications, there's certain requirements, things that have to go out. We're always trying to think of ways to streamline that, make it faster, make it fresher. Um, and he is such a huge advocate of it that it makes, you know, my life obviously way simpler and more exciting because it's, you know, you have, you know, his buy-in and his energy around it. Um, but it is, it's truly just such an exciting process. I mean, we have a, a new CIO that came in and he has been absolutely awesome and just engaged in the fact that like, let's, you know, he told his team, pretend like Tara's on our team. I want things running through with her all the time so that we're making great decisions for customers. He said, well, you know, sometimes we think through that IT lens of solve the problem. Let's make sure we're solutioning for everyone. Um, getting to be a part of all the new, you know, touches for customers and just challenging people. I think that's one of the hardest parts of being a CX leader is you constantly are saying to people, why do we do it this way? And can we do it differently? Right. That doesn't always feel great. Um, for folks that have spent a long time working on a project and then you come in and you're like, Hey, have you considered this part or this impact? Um, the neat thing too, is I, I constantly will share, experiences that you know I'm having so that our employees can also see what the impact is. And I, I shared one recently on um, LinkedIn. I went and purchased a type of seasoning that I use. And the company, I do a big purchase order for everyone in my family. We all love these seasonings. They stopped the mass ordering because they didn't want resales. Now, that's that's a problem that came in that someone in a room said, we don't want people reselling our product, so stop mass orders with no thought for the journey of the customers. It's Christmas time. There might be increased orders. So you essentially stopped business with no understanding of what the impact for customers was going to be um, based on a decision. Those are the types of things I am trying to make sure that we don't repeat, that we don't take one small problem or, or small issue that arises and solve for that issue in a silo, right? And then it rolls down to the customer. So that's where, again, having everyone's engagement and involvement um, early on in projects. And I tell people all the time, I'm going to be as, do as little disruption as, as possible. I'm going to get in. I want to understand. I'm going to ask you some questions. And if, if we feel comfortable that it's a great customer experience, I'm going to get out of your way and, and let y'all proceed with the project. But giving them those real life examples makes people go, oh, yeah, that's probably not great. So often when a CX leader like yourself is helping shift the thinking and the uh, the behavior in the organization, I like to think, Tara, that there's a what I call a, in my uh, book, The CX and Culture Connection, I call a cornerstone discipline, like um, you're, you're, you're attaching your efforts to something like human-centered design or agile product management or quality management or data science, you know, and, and, and that you're, you're skiing downhill because you're, you're, you're pushing on something that has already got some traction in the organization versus CX is something totally new. Are there any cornerstone disciplines that you're focused on, you know, in terms of evangelizing, getting adoption of that way of thinking, whether it's agility or human centered design or something else? Uh, I would probably tie it most to the human centered design um, and making sure, again, that we're making all of the parts of CX digestible and and um, the processes making sure that there's a clear understanding. We do a lot of um, PI testing with our employees as far as understanding. So getting the right team members on projects to help assist and make sure that we're getting the right buy-in. Um, I'm also a huge fan. I don't know if you're familiar with human design as an actual construct where um, you have like kind of your reading done and understand what activates people. Are they a generator? Are they a doer? All those processes. Um, I'm always naturally very curious about that to see how we put the right people in the room. I do find in a lot of projects, people will just assign these specific leaders and we might have, you know, five analytical leaders in a room. And sometimes we need that emotional leader or, um, 
that person with the woo that's going to bring the energy together. So I definitely think we would tie into that. As far as the data points, we're still you know, getting up to and running again. We didn't have a CX program 18 months ago. So I think once we have more data points, that will also become a really important part of our process and our program. Um, but we're just not there yet. How do you think about, um, you know, bringing it back to behavior adoption um, of the employees? How do you think about activating and spreading behaviors? Like what are the, the ways that you're trying to drive that? You know, you mentioned training. And what are the what are the best ways in your organization you think to to, to kind of get the, those right behaviors to spread? So I'm a huge proponent in any organization that um, positive reinforcement wins, right? So creating again the what, why, how, and then supporting, coaching, and rewarding the great behaviors. Um, I think in any organization when you clap for things that aren't true CX activities or energy, like oh I opened the door for someone, well that's a basic human like just being polite, right? So that's not something we're going to clap for, but really going out of the way, asking great questions, um, role modeling those behaviors and celebrating those pieces, I think is the most important thing. So catching people doing things correctly, celebrating those successes, highlighting them throughout the organization. Um, I found through most of the organizations I've worked with that people want to do well. I don't think anyone shows up and says, I'm going to be really bad at my job, but people really like, for the most part, being recognized for the great work. So um, my thought process is that we just actively, you know, continuously engage in these are the the behaviors, these are the processes, and then doing that reward and coaching to get folks there. Um, as as long as again the coaching models those behaviors, right? So just being like, yeah, go do CX, right? That's not coaching. When you did this behavior, Matt, the customer re- responded really, really well. We'd like to see more of that, you know, that type of behavior. That's more natural and easy to easier to do, I think, in a like contact center environment where people are, you know, you can coach, you can listen in, you can mentor, you can share feedback and and even analyze the 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 verbatims of the call using AI to recommend improvements. When you start getting more broader into the organization, like you talked about, where you're touching on the 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 app experience or the website experience or new product launches or other things that the in-branch experience, you know, other other experiences beyond a call center. How do you think differently about behavior adoption in those settings? So I see the branches in the contact center very similarly. I come out of branches. So that active coaching, having the branch manager present, listening, giving immediate feedback, um, I think is all doable. As far as the digital experience, obviously, we're going to get that from the feedback models. We're going to get that from the data on sets. We're going to do a lot of our own journey traveling to make sure that those processes work correctly and a ton of testing and then feedback from those testers. Uh, to make sure. And then obviously through our surveying and our insights of those processes to our customers, did this work the way you expected? Did Were we able to meet your needs? Did, was this a one-time? So lots of continuous measurement, continuous listening, lots of continuous improvement where the teams working on the experience get continuous feedback that they can react to and act on. thousand percent but also using it. So I don't want anyone designing processes that they haven't traveled. I'm a huge proponent of from employee and customer when you hire someone, have you gone, when's the last time you all went through our HR process of being hired, interviewed, onboarded, et cetera? When you set up a digital channel to open accounts, have we all traveled it? Have we looked at all the talking points? Um, as we set up, we have some systems with data sharing, right? What's it feel like to use, be the employee using the system? What does the customer see? If you call, this is a huge pain point for me when you call into any type of support system and you say, I'm trying to do this on my app. And someone says, well, I've never done it on the app. That's not helpful, right? So having folks having traveled both journeys, giving them, again, that empowerment, the efficiencies and the tools. Um, so it is. It's a lot of listening. It's a lot of engaging. Um, it's a lot of asking questions and learning. So all the things we're role modeling in CX, we're also doing in CX, if that makes sense, which helps, I think, employees and the folks engage. Um, I'm actively listening. I'm asking questions. I'm traveling journeys with you to learn. Um, so I think that also helps when we talked about getting it through the culture, we're doing the behaviors we're asking others to do. Um, and then from a leadership perspective, it's just in, ingraining those folks with, you know, the verbiage and the behaviors and the expectations and then creating accountability. Are you holding your folks accountable to creating really stellar experiences? Are you okay with with the service model? And if you are, that's going to show in the data points, that's going to show in your customer feedback. And I don't think anyone wants to be the outlier in that space that their CX is lagging behind the other areas, right? So there's that instant motivation um, for folks to get on board and be engaged with it. 
you touched about it earlier about AI and and and, and making sure there's a human connection there. Um, what, what do you see as some of the next frontiers that we should be focusing on with leveraging AI and CX? So my dream world, right? If I could create the perfect tool, um, AI would synchronize all of the systems put together at all levels of organizations, banks, tech, wherever that might be, um, to help take kind of a list of the top 10, t- t- 10 pain points and eliminate those, right? So the things that we've talked about, having to repeat yourself, having to re-identify yourself, having to transfer between different areas, right? All those major pain points that you see on every feedback site from every organization. If we could streamline those projects and say, let's solve for these 10 with AI so that by the time the customer ever gets to the human, if they have to, we're prepared. We're not asking them to repeat things, right? So from a banking situation, you start to self-service on our website. You ask your question. If for some reason our chatbot or our tool cannot answer it, when I transition you to the banker, the banker from the AI technology has pulled you up in my system. I can see the most recent interactions you've had. I can get on the phone and understand where you are emotionally, whether you're frustrated, angry, sad, happy, you know, having a great day. And I can immediately interact with you and solve that without you ever having to repeat yourself or feel frustration. That for me is a win for technology, right? I will just, you know, Hats off to you, tech. You win. This is amazing. Um, that's where I would like to see things go. We've had so much growth um, since I started with the black and green DOS screens where I had to type in codes back in the day to find things that, you know, with the the different CRM tools and what you are capable of doing, I'm just very excited to see how we bring those together. A lot of the AI conversation is AI is going to replace humans or AI can do this better. I just don't know how AI can make a better human emotional connection with someone and make them feel comfortable and make them feel loyal to a brand. There is not a chat bot that I've met that I went, wow, I really need to talk to them again. So I think for me, futuristically, I will be thrilled and I'm dying to see where this goes as far as creating those efficiencies. Because I think as we all know, in financial institutions, the technology stack has been built over a very long time with a lot of systems that don't talk to each other. And Uh, a lot of manual processes, that that's where for me, AI would be the most helpful if they could congregate all of the data that I need to know about you. So that when I'm in front of you, or I'm on the phone with you, or you're talking to one of my chatbots, we can really help you, Matt, as the customer, get where you're going. Pull all the data out, synthesize it, integrate it, and then present it back to you in a simpler way. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, very... uh, fertile area that I think we'll get a lot of uh, work on but and, and hopefully produce some results, you know, in the next few years, given some of the advances, but it's going to take effort and to take focus. It is. It's going to take effort. It's going to take focus. And it's, it's again, getting both sides of it because everything that you see, and even as a customer, I'm always testing. My kids are mortified because when I go, I'm like, let me test this. I want to see if I can get a survey. I want to see what they're asking. I want to see what it's touching. Um, I, still see all these things, even these huge firms where it's just very disconnected. Like in a survey, you're asking me a question that you should know the answer to. I'm like, how are we still there? Like how with all of this technology, are you confirming that I was in this location? You should know that, right? That like that for me is like an immediate AI solve. Well, I want to take this in a slightly different direction to build on something you were saying, Tara, which is, you know, earlier in the conversation, you talked about don't just focus on cost savings, focus on improving the experience. You know, so when you think about what makes the investments in customer experience self funding and high ROI, you can look at the cost side, you can look at the revenue side. The, the revenue side ultimately has a much bigger payoff. If you can drive retained revenue, you can drive, you know, customer loyalty, you can drive cross sell, upsell. It has a much bigger payoff than just lowering the cost. A lot of the focus, though, does go on the cost side of it because there's a near term payoff and how to reduce friction, how to reduce call volume, which creates a very inside out versus customer back lens like we were talking about. So there's another source of benefit that makes these investments self-funding that many companies miss out on, which is research and testing. Because there's so much effort that goes into user testing. You know, you talked about the value of putting yourself in the customer's shoes and getting people to experience and doing the mystery shopping and, and actually that's that's useful. 
One bank co company I worked with was spending $30 million a year on research and testing. And some companies have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on research and testing, you know, for product launches and, re and things like that. Um, on average, implementing some of the better, more modern customer listening approaches can save 20 to 30% of the research and testing budget. So as you grow the investment in customer experience, there'd be a tendency to spend more and more money on research and testing because all the things you're doing, I got to try that. I got to do ABN testing. I got to do user testing. Well, if you have a steady stream of insights that take advantage of the AI and all the data sets, you actually don't need to do as much as you otherwise would have had to do because there are more insights just readily available because of your constant listening efforts. So it's a both hand. You will do a lot of research and testing just if you do a lot of customer experience work, but you can do it more efficiently. And in fact, you know, in that, that bank example, they saved $6 million a year, which paid for a lot of the other investments. Yeah, agreed. I, I definitely, um, and I, of course, I'm never, you know, going to have a $30 million research budget. <laughs> so um, ideally, yes, I, I agree with everything that you said. And I do I think that's one of the trickiest parts that CX leaders, I'm not, I'm sure you've talked to tons of them will tell you is getting folks to understand the financials behind the process and all of the work that has to be done and that you're not going to see it tomorrow or next week. Um, but the cost savings of retaining customers versus finding new ones and, and doing a better job of solving for complaints and, and creating efficiencies for them. So I think that is one of the trickier parts for smaller organizations to figure out is what is the budget? What is the support? How do I show and see that, th that there is a win for this, right? So I'm doing that in very small ways um, to help the organization see. So I talked a little bit before about disclosures and requirements, right? Banks used to mail you these big packets. If I can take that packet and put it into a QR code and drive you to go online and streamline that process and create that savings, right? That's an immediate win that I can show my organization that if we rethink this journey, right? Here's the cost savings of this little tiny thing. What can we do next, right? Knowing that I, I think the numbers are like five to 25% more cost effective to retain a customer than get a new one, right? The less money we have to spend in marketing if we're growing and cultivating these relationships and bringing these folks in. The student survey that we did, right? 80% of the students that are opening accounts will stay with their bank for between, um, it's 82 and 85% will stay long-term, which means you're getting a customer through an entire life cycle. 79% of them are coming from mom and dad, right? How do we tap into that? How do we make mom and dad so happy and so connected to our brand that they drive those folks, right? That's where I can start to create those those wins for the organization to see that this is how understanding the customer base, understanding the drivers um, will create that. But to your point, it is wildly difficult to show the the cost up front versus the outcome because folks are looking for that immediate win that we can't always put into dollars, you know, as quickly as folks would like. But a lot of the investments you're making, particularly with some of the new um products and services and new digital innovations have a business case associated with them that ultimately it's going to touch customer experience to derive that business case. So you're helping, and, and that must be one of the reasons you're pulled into a lot of those initiatives because if they, one, if they get the customer experience wrong, the whole business case could unravel unanticipated problems that they could have avoided. And two, they can, they can turn a, a small peak into a bigger peak. They can make it better. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly the thing that I'm so excited about is that that was not a conversation that was happening 18 months ago. We had a project, we designed it and we went to launch and then we went to see what happened. And now we're really trying to understand, does this make sense for the customer? Is this easily digestible? Again, the big thing for me is everything that we build for a customer, we've also built the tools for the employee so they can understand it. They can articulate it. They can partner with it. They can travel it. Right. So I know I was still in branches when um, mobile banking started, which makes me age myself a little. And people would come in and say, can you help me with this? And I would hear employees go, oh, I don't have a Samsung. So no. What? Like, what do you mean? You Like, we have to be able to help all of the customers, not just the ones, the technology that you know, right? So how do we build out those processes to create better interactions? Because again, we've created a scenario where the customer needs help. They drove to see you. And the answer was, oh, I can't help with that, right? That can't ever be the answer. Um, so those are the types of behaviors, you know, that we're also working to build out. So it's, it's exciting to be a part of so many projects. And, um, Everyone's talking about customer experience at this point. Everywhere you go, I think there was a huge 
um, lift an awareness post COVID of how much things changed, right? How much you needed people as suddenly we were trying to move to computers and self checkout. And there, there is a big, um, there was a big gap that became aware for folks. So I think tying those two pieces together, we talked about, you know, the technology with the human connection, making those connections with people and just creating experiences they want to repeat is such a vital part of what we're doing. I just wanted to end on a a note. Um, We were talking about the difference between bigger and smaller companies. And a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, Tara, around inspiring and engaging your people and in giving them the tools to evolve their behavior and to engage in a way to deliver better experience and drive small incremental improvements that lead to big results is not doesn't require massive investment. It requires leadership, commitment, collaboration, and taking advantage of some of the tools that are available and and kind of walking your way into it. You don't have to do everything all at once. Tara, it's been wonderful having you on the podcast. I know you sparked a lot of great ideas for me, and I, I'm sure you did for the audience as well. Uh, how can they get in touch with you? What's the best way to continue the conversation? Um, I think through my LinkedIn profile would probably be best. It's it's Tara Brady. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. And um, I'd love to talk more about customer experience. It's fantastic to hear what you're, what you're up to. Uh, thanks for sharing your insights and experience with the audience. Uh, you sparked some great ideas for me, and I hope you did for the audience as well. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it, Matt. <laughs>